Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight when, with Union Public Library. Um, I, we're really delighted that you're here. Um, I'm just going to play with the screen, the view a little bit here. Um, uh, um, do you all see Dr. Adams on the screen? No. You know what? I'm wondering. Hold on just a moment. I think we just lost Dr. Adams. Hold on. I have her phone, cell phone number. And I'm sure she'll come back on. Oh, here she is, okay. Dr. Adams? She and I, we did a um, rehearsal yesterday. Okay. So. Yeah, okay. somehow I dropped off once your recording started or something. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start us off again. Here we okay. go. Okay. <laughs> states to both. Shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That statement represented the first major expansion of American democracy since 50 years earlier after the passage of the 15th Amendment in 1870. That constitutional amendment extended, as you will, re will recall, voting rights to formerly enslaved African Americans with these words, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of, ser of servitude. The, se the second clause of both the 15th and 19th amendments gives enforcement power to Congress. The Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation, end quote. As significant as these two milestones are, we know that constitutional amendments are not the only means of expanding American democracy, nor are they a bulwark against the contraction of that democracy. In a conceptual shift from the usual discussion of American democracy, democracy, I'd like to center African American women and their agency by briefly exploring ordinary, ordinary women's leadership, organizational mobilization, and institution building in the New Jersey suburbs. And at the end, explore with you the difference their agency made in the expansion of American democracy, especially in the areas of voting rights, and resistance to white supremacy. As we consider this historical perspective, let's also reflect on the implications and realities for our own time. From the latter decades of the 19th century through 20th, New Jersey's black women's intertwined religious and secular networks contested the valorization of suburbs as white middle-class Protestant space. Ordinary working women entered the public sphere and by their mere presence challenged the status quo. Their willingness to confront hegemonic assumptions of gender, race, and class amid the nationalization of Jim Crow segregation mattered. It mattered in the churches they built, the civic and social institutions they created, and the communities they sustained. They negotiated alliances across boundaries and axes of constructed identity and power. They expanded understanding of the societal role and responsibility of religious and secular institutions regarding social justice. Over the years, their goals evolved and their language changed, but their basic strategy of community organizing remained constant. So did their commitment to social justice, just laws and moral institutions. By 1920 and the ratification of women's suffrage, 
these women had become a force in electoral politics. They were state, regional, and national leaders. Yet they continuously had to negotiate rigid gender and moving color lines in their communities. The harder they worked, the tighter the lines encircled them. In locating the northern suburbs as a site of contestation for physical and moral space, I examine the public presence of Black women and add complexity to our understanding of how, in the struggle for social justice, ordinary women, women who operated in liminal space and required white middle-class concurrence to move forward, how these women exercised agency, that is the capacity to act independently and to make their own choices. Moreover, locating women's activism in this historical space privileges the agency of ordinary women who were integral to the suburbanization process and to expanding goals of democracy and inclusion. Their activism took many forms. Sometimes it meant simply standing up for the right to build a church in an overwhelmingly white town or to have their organized woman's work recognized by their denominations. Other times it meant engaging in direct political action and partisan politics. During the Great Depression and the New Deal, it meant fighting for jobs and housing as they resisted the strategies of white middle-class homeowners to use the economic crisis as a cover for racial cleansing. That is the removal of black and poor white residents under the guise of slum clearance. In exploring the range of moral and spatial choices over a period of profound social and ec economic change, the suburbs emerge as a discursive and physical site for the negotiation of identity and power. New Jersey's northern suburbs provide a context for illuminating the interplay of politics, gender, space, and place in local and national history. At the turn of the 20th century, railroad investors and land speculators transformed pasture land along railroad tracks into middle-class residential spaces, and thus began the process of suburbanization that has earned New Jersey the title as the quintessential suburban state. Black women were an integral part of that suburbanization process. Young Black women, most in their 20s, worked as domestic servants in the emerging suburbs. Whether as suburban residents or suburban laborers, African-Americans were intimately involved in the evolution and development of the suburbs. The demand for household laborers, maids, cooks, gardeners, chauffeurs, continued throughout the early decades of the 20th century. Swedish and Irish immigrants alone could not satisfy the middle-class service and status demands. By the end of World War I, Southern-born African-Americans were the major providers of the skilled domestic work that made the suburbs possible. From the, from the margins, ordinary women created institutions and participated in the struggle for social justice and the expansion of American democracy. The world in which they lived and worked was highly sexualized, gendered, and culturally and racially charged. Yet they reframed public issues and mobilized grassroots, grassroots activism. Although unable to halt the progression of racial prejudice or white supremacist ideology and actions nationally or locally, the presence of black women, men and children reminded those who policed the boundaries of the suburban landscape, that is the realtors, city council officials, religious leaders and businessmen, reminded them that the interests of African-Americans could not be completely ignored or totally erased. The suburban venue also serves as a reminder that we experience national and international events in intimate spaces. I invite you to journey with me to more than 100 years ago when the New Jersey northern suburbs were still frontier places and the preserve of wealthy white businessmen who wanted to remove their families from the city's teeming masses of immigrants and working poor. 
In doing so, I'll focus on three seminal moments in Black women's venture into the political arena, 1915, 1921, and 1922. By 1915, as the highly polarized fight for women's suffrage heated up, New Jersey's Black women concluded that the structural and social evils, quote, sapping the manhood and womanhood of the race, end quote, could only be addressed when Black women could vote. In the words of one woman, the ballot was nothing less than a Black woman's, quote, weapon of moral defense. Wisely used, it will bring to her the respect and protection that she needs, that she needs to reckon with men who place no value upon her virtue and to mold healthy public sentiment in favor of her protection, end quote. In the speaker's view, the black woman needed the ballot more than the white woman or the black man, for she bore, quote, the burden of the church and of the school and a great deal more than her economic share of the home, end quote. Convinced of the ballot was the black woman's weapon of defense and an instrument of social justice, New Jersey's African-American women organized the State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs in 1915. For many, the State Federation was the first interdenominational as well as secular organization they had ever joined. And it served as a bridge from missionary work to political activism. Through the State Federation, working class African-American women across the state attained a new level of public visibility and political and organizational autonomy. Moreover, their organizational presence changed the political calculus. Following setbacks and gaining legislative support for the 19th Amendment, political expediency led elite white women who had heretofore ignored black women to partner with the state federation in the suffrage battles. Adding black club women, and the thousands of women they represented to the pro-suffrage column would be a political coup. As we all know in politics, numbers matter. For their part, black women used this new organizational visibility and numerical strength to transform the, the elite white women's suffrage campaign into an interracial cross-class movement. They negotiated positions on the executive board of the White Women's Suffrage Association, a cost sharing plan for their independent suffrage organizers, and made sure their local suffrage organizations and officers share the platform at public events. By the time African-American women gained the right to vote in August 1920, New Jersey's black women were already an important poli political factor. Having learned the art of organizational effectiveness in their missionary societies and temperance unions, these church women formed county ward and district clubs and appointed precinct captains. They held campaign rallies that had the sonic and visual markings of religious revivals. They linked their individual and group progress to exercising their right to vote in local, state, and national elections. Their voter registration drives and get out the vote campaigns changed the political map. During the November 1920 election, for example, their campaign turned formerly Democratic wards into overwhelming Republican majorities, aiding the landslide victory of Republican presidential candidate Warren G. Harding and sending Dr. Walter Alexander of Essex County to the New Jersey State Assembly, making him New Jersey's first black legislator. Prior to black women's winning the vote, black men in New Jersey held no significant elective positions and Alexander a physician had actually run unsuccessfully in several previous campaigns. For decades, black women had tried to effect progressive social change without participating directly in electoral politics. Initially, they claimed civic space based upon their church work. Later, they contended that their sacrifice as women and mothers during World War I had earned them the right to be heard. Finally, in 1920, 
they demanded a place as independent actors in the electoral process, thereby adding politics to their Christian service. Unlike black women in the South who suffered disenfranchisement, New Jersey's black women carved out a role as independent political actors. Their gender and race, racial consciousness and agency led them into electoral politics. The decision to enter the political arena and through it influence public policy was a major undertaking for women who funded their activities from their meager earnings. Two years later in 1922, at a meeting in Plainfield, 200 enfranchised black women representing 17 counties organized the State Colored Women's Republican Club. The women proceeded to organize county and local polit political units throughout the state. They clarified issues and held get out the vote campaigns. White women and black and white male candidates sought their endorsement. Colored Women's Republican Club members carefully articulated their political goals. Unlike white middle-class women in the two political parties or the League of Women Voters, they said they organized out of a desire for common action and a willingness to serve. Quote, as intelligent women, they came together for strength, for inspiration, for information, end quote. Even rock-ribbed Republican women in their ranks concluded that their salvation lay in, quote, a careful study of politics, of good government, of men and measures, and support of the best candidate, end quote rather than blind party allegiance. In 1922, armed with a cudgel of the ballot and the organizational power of the Colored Women's Republican Club, Black women transitioned from a reform and uplift agenda to legislation and interest group lobbying. Identifying themselves as representatives of over 5,000 women, voting women, they partnered with a newly elected Black State Assemblyman and worked with newly elected and appointed white women office holders on local, county, and state issues. They clearly stated the remedies they sought. New Jersey's first elected Black legislator owed his victory to these women and their grassroots activism. In one of his first actions, he penned New Jersey's Modern Era Civil Rights Act that banned discrimination in all public accommodations, including restaurants, hotels, theaters, beaches, and public education from primary grades through college. Earlier in 1918, for example, moved by a very touching report, as they called it, on the condition of black women released from prison, the Club Women's Prison Reform Committee undertook a data gathering initiative on the number of African-American women parolees and parole officers. After 1920, however, with the power of the vote, these women, these women took the lead in framing legislation that required county judges to appoint female parole officers. Because of their political effectiveness, the New Jersey legislature, legislature granted floor privileges to the chairwoman of their legislative department for an entire year. Even as the symbols of citizenship tightened around a narrowly constructed vision of the Anglo-Saxon white middle-class family and a detached home, New Jersey's organized black women held fast to an alternative vision a vision of just laws and moral institutions in a multiracial society. Armed with a ballot, they, communi they communicated that vision through grassroots political activism. Their duty, they said, was, quote, to strengthen and uplift American institutions and bring them into a higher degree of moral worth by ensuring that clean, just laws are made and enforced, end quote. As one of the Republican club members stated, quote, so long as we are denied the full privileges of citizenship, 
So long as in our cities and state, we have Jim Crow segregation and other offensive measures, we must have wide awake Negro women, end quote. Black women would advocate for social justice, just laws and moral institutions. Forming the statewide organization marked a significant move in ordinary black women's confidence in their ability to effect change. The ballot was a sacred instrument and they intended to use it. The Colored Women's Republican Club remained a powerful political force into the 1930s. With little status and even less positional power, these ordinary women resisted and subverted, cooperated and partnered with more powerful black and white men and white women in working for, in their words, God and humanity. Ordinary women carry their religious convictions to the political arena. They moved from reform and personal uplift to legislation and structural transformation. The dislocations of World War I and its aftermath created new social ills and exacerbated structural and systemic evils spawned by the northernization of Jim Crow segregation. The president of the Colored Women's Republican Club declared, quote, there is no North or South, East or West. It is simply a matter of numbers and circumstances. She especially decried what she called the problem within the problem. The growing alarming rundown sections, Northern white officials, realtors and businessmen were creating in almost every town. However, New Jersey's black women discovered their ability to influence public policy had limits. The intersection of race, gender and class was fraught and their white allies could not always be counted, could not always be counted upon to support them and stand with them. For example, in 1921, prominent white suffragists in the National Women's Party turned their attention to the Equal Rights Amendment and dismissed the disenfranchisement of black women in the South as a quote, race issue, not a woman's or feminist matter, end quote. Equally as disturbing was the lack of support to end the lynching of black men and women or racial violence in the North and South. When in 1922, National, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs organized the National Anti-Lynching Crusade to unite a million women to end the domestic terror of lynching. New Jersey's black women found few allies among their white sisters. Earlier in 1919, the chair of the New Jersey Federation of Colored Women's Clubs had penned a letter to, to President Franklin Roosevelt forcefully making the case for his personal intervention to end terroristic racial attacks. Quote, excuse for lynching colored men and rioting against them is everywhere made on the ground that colored men assault white women's honor. As a student of American history, you know the story of the assaults white men have made on colored women's honor. It is written on the faces of our race. End quote. In 1922, with a ballot in hand, Black women took political action. They combined fasting, days of prayer, and church rallies with, with direct political action. They lobbied their congressmen and threatened voter retaliation against candidates who failed to support the federal anti-lynching bill. One New Jersey congressman who was conveniently absent during a, cru a crucial vote on the bill lost his seat in the fall election. Though African-American women cooperated with their white counterparts to support, to support women's legislation on marriage and divorce, industrial employment and the mother's pension bill, anti-lynching and civil rights legislation seemingly was a bridge too far for New Jersey's white women. Excuse me. 
undaunted, Black women continued to lobby for federal anti-lynching anti legislation and to an end of economic and political conditions that promoted mob violence. They appealed directly to quote, the churches and civic organizations of our community to arouse the conscience of the American public to the disgrace of this terrible blot upon our boasted 20th century civilization, end quote. They criticized government inaction against the reinvigorated Ku Klux Klan organized on the East Coast from upstate New York to the Southern Jersey shore. The Klan flourished in the Northeast from Buffalo, Buffalo, New York to Cape May, New Jersey. There was even a Klan chapter on the campus of Princeton University. Klan ceremonies were advertised in local newspapers. The abandoned quarry in Berkeley Heights and the parade grounds in New Providence, both Union County suburbs, were sites for mass Klan meetings. In November, 1923, the Klan burned 13 crosses in Newark and surrounding suburbs. Visible from New York City, the flaming crosses lit up the night sky from Saturday night into Sunday morning. As enfranchised Black women, as enfranchised citizens, Black women also spoke out against local manifestations of Northern Jim Crow. White residents and white resistance to share workspace with Black employees, exclusion of Black doctors from hospitals and clinics, biased textbooks in public schools, impediments to Black home ownership, and violence against those who moved into white neighborhoods. Because of the public respect accorded these women in the political arena, it is easy to forget that most of them wore uniforms and aprons. They scrubbed other people's floors and tended other people's children. They had to work quietly behind male denominational and civic leaders and middle-class white women. Nonetheless, their organizational strength made it, it, made it impossible to deny that black women were more than their work or that they had identities as women and citizens in their own right. They operated on the principle of one woman, one vote. And when they cast their ballots, more than an election was at stake. They were voting for social justice and civil rights on behalf of their communities and future generations. In New Jersey's Northern suburbs during the 1920s and 1930s, class and color politics, a color-coded economic structure, rising property values, and the devastation of the Great Depression eroded the gains African-Americans had made. After years of campaigning against high rents, low wages, unsanitary housing, and inadequate education, Black suburbanites found themselves under surveillance and under siege. Unemployment, poor housing, segregation, and racial hostility had increased during the Great Depression with little intervention from political, civic, or religious institutions. Later during the New Deal, New, Jer New Jersey's growing white middle-class suburbanites used federal funds to remove white and black working class residents from their suburban centers. Publicly labeling, labeling black residents, quote, slum dwellers, city councils used Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal taxpayer dollars to subsidize mortgages for single family homes and to ensure 90% financing construction loans for real estate developers and an equal guarantee for municipalities to build rental housing projects for low-income workers. The political and moral battle of class, race, and space in New Jersey suburbs was well underway. Why, you might be wondering by now, why have I, have I taken us on this journey of the activism of working women from 100 years ago? First, I am impressed with the agency political awareness and social justice commitment of these working women who did so much for their communities and for the generations that followed. 
Second, as we survey the land, our country in the second decade of the 21st century, we find ourselves faced with national and local problems of food insufficiency, lack of affordable housing, and structural and systemic racism. When democracy itself is under assault, what lesson can we learn from these women when so much work remains to be done? Finally, I will answer my question with a question to you. In a period when the world is as topsy-turvy as it was in the 1920s, when questions of race, class, gender, sex, and labor seem to be as unsettled now as then, when our very government is polarized, seemingly to the point of paralysis, what difference can grassroots organizing make? Could it be that we need both the institutional response and a national involved and, and a national movement as well as the sustained commitment of local groups. With that, I end and let's open it up for discussion. Oh, Debbie, back it, to you. Um, that was really incredible to cover so much ground in such a short amount of time. And I think that, and you see you have an applause, or you can't see it, but you have an applause um, uh, logo already. So um, two of them. So. I, I think it does, I do, I think, um, how do you see, I, I'm opening it up to everybody first and you can unmute yourself. Everybody can unmute yourself if you want to. Um, Elsa, did you have something you wanted to say? With the studying of a lot of history and knowing what has happened in the past and knowing that a lot of things have not really changed, Certain things have changed, I grant that, but many other things have not changed. And as a woman, I feel it's important to go out there and speak my mind, although a lot of people might not like it. Wonderful. I think you have uh, four mothers <laughs> who did the very same thing, driven by the very same impulse. Thank you for sharing that. So are you a pessimistic about today or optimistic or what do, what do you anticipate? And before I say that, I'm just gonna tell you all that I'm putting the name um, Dr. Livingston Adams book, how to get her book in chat. Um, and I, I will send it to you. Uh, shortly, but I'm wondering what is your outlook in terms of the future, the near future? Is that question for me? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, as a historian, uh, I, to piggyback onto what Elsa said, you know, I, I see the change and I am always delighted when I can actually plot change because as a historian, I look for change over time. Um, so that keeps me optimistic and looking forward, especially to younger generations. However, I must say as a historian, when I can document what has not changed and has not changed enough, and when we are repeating the very same thing, I am terribly pessimistic. Uh, so can I say that I see it half full and half empty at the same time? But I do, I do believe that as long as democracy stands, there will be people who will continue to fight for it. And movements, when I see the young, what young people are doing now in terms of Black Lives Matter, voter registration and getting out there and, and uh, women's right to reproduction, saying I have faith and I have hope. The struggle continues hope endures. I hope so. <laughs> I hope hope endures. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if anyone else would like to comment or ask a question. I think I see Janice's hand. Janice is up. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, very great talk. I enjoyed it very, very much. And I wanted to, to say you asked about the efficacy of grassroots today. I will have an example. My sorority just on Monday, we all, or as many in the chapter as possible, sent in letters to, we're in, I'm in Texas, to the legislature. They were about to talk about the redistricting maps that they had redrawn mm -hmm. and certainly not in our favor. Yes. And so we were prote protesting that and it, it felt good. So I'm, I'm with Elsa, let, let us speak up and especially in groups if we can to do all we can to let them know, listen, you're not gonna run over us. And then I had one other quick question. I was wondering about the women who became the leaders of the Colored Women's Republican Club or the Federation of Women's Clubs. I was taking notes as, as we went along. <laughs> uh, were, they, were they college educated women? Who were these ladies? <laughs> Very good question. I'm glad you asked that. They were not college educated women. I mean, these were young women, as I stated, who actually came for jobs in the suburbs. Okay. And they were not the elite that we usually talk about, Mary Church Terrell and, you know, that whole group uh, at Howard University and all of that. Now, these are Oberlin. These were working women, young working women who would act, could actually sit across the table from their employers, these white women for whom they worked and were not afraid to speak out in terms of what was needed and to gain their support. Most of them uh, actually had um, education up through like eighth grade or so in their hometowns before they left and migrated North. So they were literate, they were well-read they used their uh, women's missionary society meetings to become informed on political and social issues, to have this broader perspective. For them, there was no distinction between what they did uh, in terms of their own spiritual development and growth and what was required in the world. So they continued to grow and to learn. And the surprising thing is that eventually, uh, college educated professionals and wives of doctors and uh, other physicians became part of their group. One of the things I found that was interesting is that the black professional and elite class did not come to an area until working women had already organized something and it moving. You know? And when you think about it, it makes sense. If you are a physician, you want to go where you have possible clients, exactly. So these ordinary working women uh, just found each other in the marketplace, the street, put little notices in the newspaper that said, we're meeting, join us. And out of these grew churches and other uh, institutions. Yeah. So th they were marvelous. <laughs> Very much so. So thanks so much for that question and that observation. I have a question because I know that they started out as the Republican Party, you said. And with the last election, what had happened that is specifically what happened in, in, in uh, Georgia. And then when did the shift happen that they changed from Republican to Democrat? Did that happen? I, I would think it did. Oh, it absolutely did. Now bear in mind. The Republican Party was the party of Lincoln, the party of emancipation. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, when Black women got the vote, when Black men got the opportunity to vote in 1870, most of them were Republicans. So that loyalty to the party of Lincoln carried over for a very long time. And interestingly enough, it was Black women who began to question the party, accuse them of betrayal, not speaking up. And it wasn't until uh, Franklin Roosevelt's really like his second term in the 1930s 
46. That the uh, many Black Americans pulled away and said, you know, we've been loyal to the Republican Party, but the Republican Party has betrayed us. And let's try this new party. And it has been a slow progress. And it really wasn't until the 1950s that you see those large wide swing nationwide in terms of African-Americans to the Democratic Party. I can remember when my father um, cast his first Democrat, his, well, we were living, we were in Louisiana and it was a one party state, Democrats. <laughs> uh, Dixocrats, Democrats. And he actually voted Republican and he said, I'm sorry, he voted, no, he did vote for a Republican then and he said, uh, I know I'm signed up as a Democrat, but I'm voting for the best man. Oh. So it was that kind of thing. So, but, but yes, in many places, especially in the South, it was a one party uh, state. But to, to get back to the question, yes, uh, African-Americans moved to the Democratic Party, party during the New Deal and after, and certainly after World War, World War II. Thank you. I, I have a question to you and to, Jan, uh, to Janice, which is, um, I'm horrified by what's going on in Texas. That's a personal opinion, not a professional one. And I'm wondering what my role is in terms of writing to the Texas legislature or the Texas whatever. Um, in the same way, what is my role in causes that I am not directly a member of? Well, I, I, I'll just say that I see lots of things online that um, various groups move on and other national groups want as much participation from a particular state and broader as they can possibly get. So I, I would think that you would have a voice there. But I'll tell you, we're here in Texas, we're doing all we can. <laughs> But certainly would 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 welcome your help <laughs> because I, I I I'm wondering other than sending money, does an out of state voice have impact? And I think I'm going to stop the recording so maybe everybody will feel a little freer to talk. 